the discussion at this conference during the past two days has been rich, engaging, and stimulating. It has been a learning experience for me, and I'm sure there has been some learning for all of us. Um, it was only at lunchtime that the chairman told me I would speak last. The last word is often thought of as a privilege, uh, but I must confess I'm somewhat diffident, if not intimidated. Uh, what can I possibly say that would be engaging enough at this stage, uh, for time and patience are both exhaustible resources. It is impossible for me to sum up, and it would be futile to do so. Ingrid did such a wonderful job. Um, therefore, I thought I should exploit my comparative advantage as an economist, um, and I'm going to set before you four propositions and an example. Uh, it will not be as entertaining as four weddings and a funeral, uh, but since Angus Deaton titled his wonderful book, The Great Escape, uh, I think this is politically correct. Um, these four propositions and the example, I hope, will help us understand as also analyze crisis uh, in terms of how we respond to them. Uh, and therefore, uh, I want to leave you with some points, issues, thoughts to reflect on as we leave here. Now, the four propositions are about occurrence, understanding, responses, and spread of crisis. Uh, let me begin with occurrence. The distinction between continuing unexpected and future crisis that Tony and Rachel made at the very outset is clear. Uh, even so, there are different ways of seeing, and I would like to suggest an alternative perspective to distinguish between what I would describe as perennial crisis, conjunctural crisis, and quiet crisis. Uh, the perennial crises are the obvious ones. Poverty, unemployment, hunger, disease. These are multiple crises in the daily lives of poor people everywhere in the world, what Naipaul once described as the million mutinies. They are not just continuing, they are persistent, they are mounting, and they are silent crises. They are visible, but not audible. Uh, these crises provide some cause for concern in the in international community, but that is not its focus. Uh, and ultimately, that is only reasonable because such problems must be addressed within countries at national, provincial, or local levels. Second, there are conjunctural crises, civil wars, ethnic conflicts, academic, epidemics that may be viral or bacterial, uh, natural disasters, or in the world of economics, a financial crisis or commodity price bus. Okay? And it is these conjunctural crises that are often the focus of the international community. And third, there are the quiet crises. Uh, climate change, demographic imbalances, and I can think of other examples such as drug-resistant microbes, or water wars that might come, or even employment, not in Ingrid's sense of jobless growth, but employment in a world where artificial intelligence and robotics replace human beings in the world of work. And indeed, there are crises that we cannot even anticipate. Now, these are much more like treadmills rather than time bombs. They are implosive rather than explosive. Uh, there is a consciousness somewhere, but there is not cognition enough. Now, thinking about each of these crises uh, is often in specific domains, 
much like Rachel said yesterday, or Tony, in silos. Now, such sort of limited views miss out on intersections, interconnections, and interdependence. Uh, uh, and it will be no exaggeration to state that the whole is different from, if not greater than, the sum total of parts. Uh, and it is the whole together that shapes or affects the well-being of human beings. Um, the second proposition is understanding. Let me begin with a distinction that is often attributed to Donald Rumsfeld. Now, lest some of you think I'm being politically incorrect, uh, I should say that it has a much more respectable lineage in economics in the work of George Ekoloff, uh, which I have always much admired. Uh, and that distinction is between the known knowns, things that we know we know, the known unknowns, things that we know we do not know, and unknown unknowns, things that we do not know that we do not know. Now, uh, the perennial crisis are, in a sense, the known knowns. They are easily observed in the daily lives of people. Uh, the known unknowns are most of the conjunctural crises that surface from time to time. The risks are known, but the occurrences are unexpected. Okay? And the unknown unknowns, may I suggest, even if it is somewhat caricature or exaggerated, are the quiet crisis that are cumulative, or crises that we cannot anticipate, indeed, even imagine, uh, that might surface 20, 25 years from now. Now, I think there is something that can, we can learn from economic theory. Uh, in many ways, the known knowns and known unknowns are embedded in asymmetric information. Uh, uh, if you think of a restaurant, the staff knows that the kitchen is filthy, but it is unknown to the customer. Or if you go to a petrol pump, Akerlof's example, the staff knows that the fuel gauge is flawed, but the buyer does not. Okay? So it's known to someone, but unknown to someone else. Um, at the same time, there's something we can learn from decision theory. Uh, because that is about reasoning underlying choices that individuals or people make, okay? Now, these choices are always made on the basis of known unknowns, but can never be made on the basis of unknown unknowns. Uh, and last but not least, uh, I think the distinction that John Maynard Keynes made between risk and uncertainty is relevant. Risk is something we can model. Risk is something we can insure against. But uncertainty is something that we cannot model. And many crises, in the quiet crisis, unknown unknowns fall into this category. Third, responses. Now, I may have not paid sufficient attention but almost every conversation in this conference I heard was about crisis management. It is indeed a natural focus, but I heard very little about crisis prevention, right? uh, which is necessary, yet in such discourses often neglected, if not ignored. Now, if we think of crisis management, uh, clearly what matters is the speed of response. What matters are the resources that we can mobilize to combat the crisis and the institutions that we can deploy to utilize these resources effectively. Um, and the third, in crisis management, what economists describe as the principal agent problem, uh, you know, tax, income tax expectors everywhere except the IRS in the United States uh, might not wish to collect taxes and might collect rents. 
and there is a principal agent problem. Uh, there's similarly, similarly a problem between state and non-state actors who, who will address crises. Uh, so I think uh, in terms of analytics in crisis management, we need to be concerned with speeds of response, uh, with resources, with institutions, and with principal agent problems. Um, in crisis prevention, and uh, I hope this is something we will reflect on further. Uh, I don't have the answers, but I think asking the question is important. Uh, if we want crisis prevention, uh, recognition is a strong word, but cognition matters, and so does understanding of crises to come. Uh, just as institutional mechanisms that need to be created uh, to anticipate crisis in terms of timing or magnitude or to, 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 to prevent them, as it were, from happening. Uh, and this does require, at the end, coordinating action and coordinated policies, uh, both on the part of st the state and non-state actors. But what I want to stress, and that's the moral of this third proposition story, is that both crisis management and crisis prevention require collective action. It is not something that can be left either to individuals by themselves or to markets by themselves. And that is the old-fashioned logic of collective action. The fourth proposition is about spread. And that actually leads almost naturally into my example. Uh, I think we can make a distinction between what are national crises, essentially within countries, within borders, and what are international crises uh, across countries, across borders. Now, six decades ago, this would have been a good distinction and would have been mutually exclusive, and perhaps even exhaustive. Alas, uh, during the past three decades, globalization driven by market forces and technological change has led to a very rapid, almost exponential increase in openness, interdependence, and integration uh, of the world economy. Economies are global, even if politics is national and as politics tries to reassert national identities, the economic realities are different. Uh, the inevitable consequence is what I would call spillovers. National crises, Ebola, Zika, cross borders to become international and could indeed even become global. Um, International crises, whether global or not, can have national consequences. They do. Uh, I could think of many examples. I'm sure everybody can. So I will not take up your square's time. Now, this reality of spillovers has witnessed a profound change in the past three decades in the world around us. And what I have described as conjunctural crises or quiet crises are mostly of this nature. Now, uh, Mr. Chairman, I will, you will forgive me if I overstep my time by perhaps three, four minutes. Uh, I will conclude with my example. Now, in markets and societies at the national level, it is the role of governments to provide, and this example is the global context, all right? the world we live in. Now, is the role of government to provide public goods, such as road signs, street lights, or public parks, as also to regulate public bads, such as pollution or unfair competition? The logic of markets is exactly the same at the international level, but there is no world government that would provide international public goods, such as world peace or a sustainable environment, and regulate international public bads, such as international crime, or trade in drugs, arms, people, and organs, and increasingly cross-border terrorism. 
Yet the openness, interdependence, and integration associated with globalization mean that the functions of governments in providing public goods or regulating public bads will somehow have to be undertaken at a global level. Right? Now, the momentum of globalization, despite the hiccups, is such that the power of national governments is being reduced through incursions into, into hitherto sovereign economic and political space without a corresponding increase in effective international cooperation or supranational government, which would regulate market-driven processes. Uh, now, in a world where the pursuit of self-interest by nations means uncoordinated action or non-cooperative behavior, suboptimal solutions, President's dilemma outcomes, which leave everybody worse off, are a likely outcome. International public bads tend to increase. International public goods tend to decrease. Now, such outcomes can be prevented only by evolving institutional mechanisms for cooperation between nation states, uh, which facilitate coordinated action and cooperative behavior. Now, the economic characteristics of public goods, Economics 101, non-excludable and non-rival in consumption, are the same, irrespective of whether the public goods are local or global. Whenever the benefits of a public good transcends national boundaries, it can be described as a global public good. Uh, the obvious examples are global security, stabil economic stability, global environment, global health, and indeed, even global knowledge. The provision of such public goods, global public goods, is a central part of the logic of international collective action, something that Inge Kohl has never tired of emphasizing. But the rationale for collective action across countries goes further, for it can address any form of market failure. The provision of gold public goods requires that we ensure a contribution from all countries to meet their international obligations. Now, the United Nations was created to provide global security and world peace. The WHO was, was established to promote global health. Neither has achieved its stated objective. Their success has been determined and limited by their ability to elicit the requisite cooperation or contribution from nation states. Uh, the provision of global public goods, therefore, requires the strengthening of existing institutions in some areas. We need to restore the credibility, the effectiveness, and the legitimacy of the United Nations system, and the creation of new institutions, missing institutions in other areas. Now, there is a common presumption that global public bads are simply the analog of global public goods, where negative externalities spill over across national boundaries. Uh, and many of, of, of the crises that we are, we are reflecting on um, are of that kind. Now, the obvious examples are environmental degradation, international crime, or cross-border terrorism, and such examples can be multiplied. The presumption, however, is not correct. For global public bads have distributional implications. Chemical factories might yield profits for producers in one country, but acid rains for residents across the border in another country. Deforestation might sustain livelihoods for the poor in one country, but cause floods that hurt people across the border in another country. The gainers and the losers then are in different countries. Now, uh, forgive me that this one sentence, you know, orthodox economics offers almost no solace. Uh, prisoner's dilemma outcomes cannot be mitigated by cost theorem solutions. For even in situations where there are no transaction costs, there is complete information, and there are well-defined property rights, those who gain may not be in a position to, or indeed, more correctly, may not, may not wish to make compensation payments to those who lose. The regulation of global public bads, then, and many of our crises are in that category, necessarily required internationally agreed but nationally implemented rules that enforce restraint on the part of economic agents, whether individuals or firms, in all countries. But it also requires finance for the needed compensation payments. Such international rules, even when funds are available, would have to be supported by mechanisms 
for enforcement and dispute settlement. We know how that difficult that is from our discussions on the multilateral trading system. In conclusion, the institutional framework for provision of global public goods and the regulation of global public bads could in principle extend to public-private partnerships as for climate change and clean development. In other words, market institutions or commercial mechanisms may be a useful complement for public action, but they will not and cannot be a substitute for public action. Uh, it should also be possible to forge cross-border coalitions between nation states and interest groups in civil society for this purpose, coalitions of the willing. However, I fear, uh, much as I want to end on an optimistic rather than a pessimistic note, such institutional mechanisms would materialize only when the costs and benefits of unilateral self-insurance within countries are compared with the costs and benefits of international collective action across countries. Now, this calculus is necessary both for the provision of global public goods and the regulation of global public bads. I cannot stress enough, uh, at least my belief in the importance of public action mm, and of international collective action in addressing crises. Uh, these colleagues are my four propositions and an example. Thank you for your time.